Who did your graphic? That's a terrific graphic. C'est moi. Oh. <laughs> I hate you so talented. Merci beaucoup, mon frère. <laughs> tu tweeted toi. Ouais. <laughs> What is happening? <laughs> non. Tu n'es pas even, français? Mm. Not even in the slightest. If you heard, my no was very much American. Ah, d'accord. You're not going to get anything out of me more than Royale with cheese. That's about as far as I can. <laughs> Hello, and welcome to another episode of This Wooden O. Joining us this week is a fantastic actor who has performed with Rude Grooms in Romeo and Juliet, as well as The Changeling, one of our favorite people who we are so excited to chat with today. Please welcome to This Wooden O. Elizabeth Ahrens. Hello. So nice to see you. So Thanks nice for being here, Elizabeth. Thanks for having me. <laughs> so if you've ever seen anything Rude Grooms, then uh, you've probably seen Elizabeth because she's amazing, Wee. as Daniel said. We have talked around Elizabeth, specifically the first episode we talked about in terms of momentum. If you go back to that episode and you listen to the segment where we talk about mm. people whose auditions were so good in the room that we had to add tracks for them. Well, even I forgot about that. Why yeah. are you listening to our show so much? Daniel? That's a little bit narcissistic. I have, to, I, have to, I have to say that. I gotta boost our numbers, man. If right, that's true. Yeah. So if you we listen, need that ad revenue, come on. <laughs> exactly. So if you listen, tell your to, friends or just get four podcast apps. <laughs> <laughs> so way back in our first episode, we talked about how there were certain people whose auditions and whose energy were so strong and so good and so vibrant that in some cases we had to add tracks for them. Little fun fact, we were specifically talking about you in those episodes. You came in and gave such a wonderful, just joyous audition. For Capulet. For Capulet. That you, it was you, amazing. You walked out of the room, and after the door clicked, I waited a few seconds until I was fairly certain that you were out of earshot. And then I immediately turned to Monty and was like, we have to find a place to put her in the show. Because I thought your audition was just so lovely and full of joy. It was infectious. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Oh, my. <laughs> I'm turning red here. <laughs> it was pretty cool. I. It's very rare that uh, women get called in, certainly, you know, ever to read or audition for, you know, men's roles. And that role in particular was so interesting to me because a lot of people who I've seen play it do the angry, loud dad thing, and it's one note, and it's not really interesting to me. Mm -hmm. And so I was excited to play around and see alternative approaches to what we could do with that. And I remember that audition in particular as being so delightful because you took time in the room to work and get to know me and give direction. Mm -hmm. um, and that is just so rarely done that I was just crossing both fingers and toes and legs hoping it would work out. Do you normally audition for roles that are atypical or outside of your typically cast gender? Or I frequently do. Really? Yeah. I'll go to the breakdowns and I'll submit myself and in the notes I'll say, would would you be willing to see a woman for this role? And how often do you get called in for it? Very rarely. Mm -hmm. It's it's a handful of companies that still, which surprises me, I thought we'd be a little bit more progressive than that. Has there been any shift in that in the past 18 months? 18 months, certainly. I think even in the past you know, five years, there are more and more companies who are doing it now, which is really, really lovely to see. It's now no longer a novelty or a surprise, right. which I think is you know, step in the right direction for sure. Mm -hmm. What is it for you that draws your attention to these roles that you would typically not be considered for in terms of casting? They're usually written with a lot more assertion, directness, mm. and female roles typically, in my experience, aren't written as that. You know, female roles are written to be, you know, the arm candy or the, you, you know, make crack the joke and then you're done or you deliver the drinks and you're off. And still to this day, I find that a lot of male roles are written with more thought and heft. Hmm. That, and that interests me. How did you become an actor? <laughs> <laughs> I come from a very, very large family with tons of cousins in the Midwest, born and raised in Kansas. And there's not a lot to do there. So what we would do at family get-togethers was put on plays. 
which I would write, star, and direct, <laughs> of course. Wow. And so that was the beginning of it, really just using your creativity. Because this was before, you know, Nintendo came out and all that. Um, so you, you entertain yourself. So we did that growing mm -hmm. up. And then there was a civic theater. And I remember saying to my mom, Mom, I think I want to act. But I didn't know what that meant. And she said, well, I'm going to take you down to Topeka Civic Theater. And they gave me a tour. And uh, I was so excited by the people that were working there and, and what that place promised. But I was very, very scared to audition. So the first thing that I did was run a spotlight for really? a show. Uh, how and old were you when you were in the spotlight? I was 13, 14. And, and then I worked up the courage to work running crew backstage. <laughs> and that was really big. Got to wear a badge. And then I auditioned and that was it. And then when I learned that I could major in that in college, I was like, oh, done. This is, this is it. And where'd you go to college? I stayed in state, went to the University of Kansas. Mm -hmm. Fabulous program, actually. And then when did you come to New York? By way of Florida for grad school at Florida State Oslo Conservatory. Hey, shout out to Florida State. Another great program. Came to New York about a decade ago. Does did that you make enjoy me living a real on a New circus? Uh, oh, yeah. I think, I think 10 years <laughs> 10 is the years, rule, right? That's, it. that's yeah. what I was always told. 10 yeah. years in your official. Yeah. Yeah. I did a show at Florida Studio Theater several years ago and spent a lot of time on the. I think it's the Ringling Circus Museum or something. Yeah, that's yeah. right. I and they have a tremendous art collection. Oh, the art gallery is extraordinary. Yeah. But his house is a recreation of the, the Venetian Doge's Palace. Really? Yeah, in Sarasota. And the original Oslo was brought over brick by brick from Scotland. It's a like Scottish Victorian theater, I think. Is that right? Yes. And it feels very like you're performing in a museum. We did The Giver. Did you have to read that book when you were a kid? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah that we book. did The Giver there. Hmm. Pretty, Didn't they make a, a movie cool there recently? Yeah. Yeah, they did. I don't remember hearing great things about it. It was with one of the Kevins, right? Is it Kevin Klein who's in it? Was it Kevin Klein? I'm not No, who's the, who's the guy that drinks uh, uh, old r Russians? White, White Russians? Russians? Jeff Bridges. One of the Jeffs. That's right. <laughs> I can never get Jeff Daniels and Jeff Bridges straight. <laughs> I try. I really try. They're very similar. And one of them's in Tron and exactly. one of them is in the newsroom. That's exactly. all I know. Right. <laughs> Jeff Bridges is always in my brain because I watched Big Lebowski for the first time in college. And when I was not of a legal drinking age yet, but knew the places to go in New York where they didn't card you. What? Mm-hmm. I found that one of my first introduction as a little baby drinker was uh, I would go to bars and ask for white Russians before I knew better about ordering milk, <laughs> oh, ordering God. drinks involving milk. <laughs> I think <laughs> you've just defined natural selection. Yep. And the fact that I am still here <laughs> proves that my genes are superior and I have made it. That's right. So I survived dancing with death in terms of alcohol in my early days. But now my... Um, my mom's boyfriend likes to make cocktails whenever uh, whenever we're home, and he actually makes a mean white Russian. I have never had a white Russian. Is it just <gasps> milk and vodka? Is that all it is? Oh, no. So many other delicious things. Mm -hmm. It's like Kahlua and cream. And a couple of a couple of other things. I don't entirely know the recipe. But you just need just one, just one. <laughs> you have more than that. You're going to be regretting it. Yeah. yeah, it's a rough night if you if yeah. you have if you're knocking back white Russians. It's a bad night. It's like eggnog. Yeah. You have yeah. one and then you're over. Yeah, that definitely is what happens with me. <laughs> it's exactly how it goes always. Very healthy. I look forward to seeing you all in 50 years when I'm still alive. I so admire the sense of play that you bring to each of the roles that I've seen you do. Where does that sense of play come from? Because I kind of do sit there in awe whenever I watch you work. I find myself to be a pretty cerebral person and any chance I get to just sort of slough off the brain and just be a kid again, mm. I will take. So a lot of it, I think, just comes from really turning off the brain mm. and just being present in the moment and, yeah, being being a kid again, exploring, having fun. I have found that... If I dig too deep and give my character a backstory and do all that stuff, it doesn't work for me. It just sort of mm. weighs me down. Uh, so I literally just look at the text on the page mm -hmm. and I look at it very, very closely. And what does the text tell me? What does the sound of the word tell me? And uh, I sit with it in quiet and let it speak to me and go from there. Hmm. Has it always been that way for you? Because I feel like 
for me, getting thrown into some processes like you've recently been thrown into with us, if not with other companies, often when I'm working with like Seven Stages Shakespeare or some other of the like super under-rehearsed companies, and it's like, oh, you can't do that, but you got to get there anyway. I feel like that fundamentally shifted how I could enter a room. And I, I wonder if if you've always been that way or if there was some moment that shifted that for you. Yes. Joining your group shifted it for me. <laughs> really? How so? Uh, d- just what Monty said. Uh, the, the, the way that you work is a much more condensed uh, rehearsal period. So what lots of companies do is give you three, four, if you're lucky, five or six weeks rehearsal, which means you come in, you're not off book. All you've done is your actor homework. You've looked at the script. You've looked up your words you don't understand. You've done the scansion if it's Shakespeare or other classical works. Um, and then you find it as you go along through the rehearsal process. Mm-hmm. You don't have to be memorized. You memorize as you go along and figure out your blocking. You've got that crutch in your hand. And with your company, it's, it's quite the opposite. You have to be very, very prepared in order to find that arc and find your choices in the, in the consolidated amount of time that we've got. And it was terrifying when I first joined you guys, but it, that was also wonderful. It was, it was forcing me to stretch and do something outside of my comfort zone, which was good. For having done both now, do you prefer having a shorter or a longer window of time? On principle, I like longer windows just because you get paid as artists. That's and fair. I think that's a dying. <laughs> that's Unless your own showcase code. It's your own showcase code, exactly. Um, I, I think I think the theater has been shifting in an unfortunate way in America. Um, but uh, now that I know that I can do the, the condensed rehearsal period, it's pretty flipping cool. Do you have a preferred way of working? I like the shorter version because it does not give me time to sort of lollygag about Mm. part of, and this is something that I'm working on as a person is getting better at procrastinating. And so, and I hear it in my head, if I have a six week rehearsal process, (laughs) then my brain just goes, Oh, you got time. It's fine. You don't need to do this right now. You don't need to worry about being off book. Don't worry about doing this character analysis yet. You got time. You got six weeks. That's so many days. And all the hours, it's nothing. But with the shorter rehearsal windows that we have, there are all of these people who are counting on you to pull your own weight. Right. And so if you have a limited amount of time to get your stuff together, you have really got to make sure that you are on top of everything that you need to be on top of. The first time I sit down at a table, I will be off book. Because I want to make sure that I am present and here for the other actors in the room. And I know myself enough to know that if I'm concerned about making sure I know which words are coming next, I'm not going to be present for you. And if I know I only have three or four days to be off book, that means you're getting up in the morning and you are putting these words in your mouth for an hour and a half. And then before you go to bed at night, you are putting these words in your mouth for an hour and a half. See, I think I was at the opposite end of the spectrum. I was the last person to be off book, and I think I had the (laughs) smallest role, but I knew I had to go on stage and get that person to do something, so I would (laughs) ad-lib while I try to get you to do that thing, and then the words will come. Do you have a preferred way of working? Oh, this way. That's (laughs) why I make everyone else do it this way in this company. Um, Yeah, there's something something about... I remember it was in an acting class... It wasn't for film, but they were using film as the barometer. They're like, you know how like on camera, you kind of want to not quite know your lines yeah. and then mm. you're the best. You want to be in complete fear of utter failure at all times. You want to be so, so, so prepared, but not prepared enough to be confident because you're, it's like a, it's like a rock star. Like your voice is at the brink of failure at all points. Mm. And I was like, oh, you know where that doesn't ever happen? The theater. Mm. It's like you walk into a theater and you see these like Barbie dolls being it's placed and radio voiced. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, Nobody's actually ever present. They're phoning it in. They're thinking about their next line rather than actually listening to the person that they're on stage sure. with. Sure. And I remember a very specific uh, a regional production of a play where even the movements of my fingers were choreographed. Mm-hmm. Really? Yeah, it, it, was to, it was to deal with the, the ways in which a finger would move towards the other hand were dictated to me hmm. by a director. We had a 
two week rehearsal process, but unlike ours, it's like, and that two week, you walk in, the first thing that happens is like you enter here, you step here on this line, you turn this, you turn 40 degrees this way on this line, you deliver this line with this intonation, and then you do this thing with your foot on this line. And I don't think that's atypical. I think a lot of companies and, and theaters work that way. Here's the picture that we're going to fulfill. And right. then your job as an actor is to sort of fill that vessel that you've been just told what to do with and where to stand and where to pop your knee. Which is why it feels like a hollow vessel, because it's a hollow vessel. Yes, Mm. It's that scenic painter in Central Park who's painting the painting of the painting of the painting. Exactly. (laughs) When you work in those environments where everything down to the moment is blocked and choreographed and ironed out, how do you keep things spontaneous and fresh and fun for yourself? I have to approach those blocking parameters as uh, guideposts. Um, I've got to hit this and do that. And in between that, there's so much space and nuance with which you can play. The breath, how you cross the stage, what you're looking at, how you raise your eyebrow. There are so many other things that you can play with and, or none of that, or you are simply literally just breathing and being present. And that's a far more effective way to fill the space and the time on stage than waiting for the next person to speak. Just be present. Just listen. And, and I, my eye as, as a spectator goes to those actors who do that, who are watching what their um, colleagues are doing. As an audience member, how can you tell the difference? I guess it's where you're throwing your energy as an actor. And if an actor's energy and presence is not in the scene, I'm going to feel it leaking off stage. I'm going to see it in their head. I can literally see them making their shopping list or, you know, thinking about what they want to have for dinner that night. Like the, the, the spirit and the mind sort of steps out of the body for a little bit. And then the body's dead. It's not there. It's not alive on stage. Hmm. I remember something that we heard in, uh, in drama school from, I think it was from Anya who was just on a few episodes ago. If you, if you listen to that episode that when, when actors are really present, when you have two present engaged actors on stage, you can almost see an energetic tether between their cores. Hmm. I don't know if that was just like implanted in the back of my brain, but I feel like I literally can see that sometimes with like an actor and another actor or an actor and a prop or an actor and the audience. I feel like I can quite literally see a vibration in space between these objects. I totally agree. And are but we just why is crazy that so, people? No, no. Why is that so surprising? Like that's what we are. I don't, you know, I keep, it's interesting. I keep a day job in finance and it's been a terrific day job. I've been there for about a decade but I work with very, very different minded people who do totally different things for a living. And that corporate culture is one of utter disconnect. It's people sitting at cubes at their desk, looking at their monitors. There's very little human interaction. Um, so I don't care if it's real or not. I just love seeing people <laughs> <laughs> talking to each other and, and connecting. Cause I think, you know, our world is progressively more and more not that. I think part of the reason that that metaphor is so visceral is because it's a hundred percent correct. And I tend to be more aware of it in the everyday world than I am in the theater world, because in the everyday world, it is so uncommon that it's remarkable, as in worthy of being remarked upon. One of my favorite places to see it is not only in my day job, because it lets you know like who's really cool with whom, but one of my favorite places to see it is when I'm out places with my friends and I see two people on maybe a first or second date. Oh, yeah. That's oh, where yeah. that's where you can really see the idea of that tether manifesting, because you start to notice things like... What date is it for these people? How comfortable are they with one another? Who's got the nervous energy? Who's got the confident energy? Are they really connected to each other? Or is she just thinking about how she's going to meet up with her friends after this and give them a really good story? Mm. Is she really trying to get this guy to like her? Is he trying too hard to be funny? Is he not picking up on signals that she's not interested? And then you start to notice things like one of the things that... uh, that my mom likes to talk about, and she is a media consultant. She says, if you want to know whether or not someone is actually being present with you and listening and engaging with you, don't look at their face. 
She's like, don't even look at their shoulders. The most telling indicator in, in terms of body language is their feet. Look at where their feet are pointed. If their feet are pointed toward you, that's a nonverbal communicator that they are present and engaged and they are listening to what you have to say. But if their feet are pointed away from you, that's a nonverbal communicator that they are looking for a way to disengage. They're looking for a way to end the conversation. In grad school, we both went to... a. Uh, uh I'm using air quotes right now if you're listening on the radio. Wonderful undergraduate theater program. <laughs> um, in a master's program, is there any of this human behavior that is studied? Sure. I mean, I think that that is the core job of being an actor is observing human behavior and replicating that and asking yourself, is what I'm doing on stage observable human reality? Like, I remember uh, uh, you had given a note, don't walk backwards on stage. When do we ever walk backwards in real life? Very few times do you ever see somebody walk backwards. Something being thrown at your face, you walk backwards. Exactly. Hmm. You know, another thing that came to mind as you were speaking about the tether was an article uh, that was presented well, to me. I like me. that word, tether. <laughs> presented to me for the first time in grad school. So this has been a number of years ago, but it was about mirror neurons. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. <laughs> right? So that, it, that intrigues me because that for me speaks to what it is that connects us and, um, uh, creates empathy. And I think that's really what we're going for as theater artists. We're hoping that the people in the audience can feel it what we're doing on stage and are experiencing it with us. Mm -hmm. So on that, there's the, the idea that it doesn't matter if you feel it, it matters if the audience feels it, mm. right? Mm -hmm. Which I agree with. I totally agree with. But if we have these mirror neurons, right? If, if the idea is that by going there, the audience can mirror that and go there. I think that, I think what fires the mirror neurons is watching someone do a task, right? Which is the definition of acting. You are doing an act of something. So you must remain in action somehow. Mm -hmm. And that is what triggers the mirror neurons in the audience and in your scene partner. They then, and there haven't been many studies still yet on humans, but they think that it, that is the root of empathy. It's why, uh, for example, if you see, if you see uh, someone with a, uh, uh, I don't know why it's coming, a rancid pot of yogurt and they smell it and they do, oh, and the, oh, gross. You can smell it yourself and you get that sick feeling. You're not smelling it. It's not there. You're not experiencing it, but you know exactly what that's like. Right. So I think even if you are on stage with a, what is supposed to be a rancid pot of yogurt, but you don't really smell it, but you, you act that and fill that vessel, your job as an actor, the audience can see it and experience it. And sometimes maybe we as theater artists who are more used to seeing a variety of replications of those actions. So we can see if they're actually doing actual sense memory in that moment and we can be like, Oh, bull oh vengeance. Yeah, or <laughs> you're recreating, you're recreating the action correctly, mm. but there's nothing, there's no there there. There's nothing underneath that. You're just doing the surface. Mm -hmm. Whereas an audience member who maybe who's not, as steeped in watching recreation of human behavior would only see the tip of the iceberg and still have that response. I just went three, <laughs> down three <laughs> tangents in my own mind with that one. Uh, sure. Short answer is yeah. <laughs> I want to hear about these tangents. Yeah, Come please. On now. <laughs> no, no, something else, something else. Do you have another question? <laughs> <laughs> as an artist, how do you keep things fresh and new and present for yourself when you're on the second or the third or the fourth week of a run. I think it's funny. It's, it's what you were speaking about in terms of on camera acting. I forget it. I forget everything I'm saying until the moment I say it. Really? And there's sometimes I really just don't remember my next line. And then I'm comfortable enough with that split second of, Oh, I don't know what I'm going to say next. And then miraculously it it's comes. there. Yeah. And if you learn, if I learned how to not react to the terror of that, just mm -hmm. to sit and be present and then it's there and then you move on. How, I, how long did it take you to get comfortable with that? I think I was doing that before I got trained. Really? And wow. I, and I, and then I got really trained 
And that's all I was thinking about is, am I speaking this correctly? Am I moving correctly? Am I, you know, uh, <laughs> and then I had to forget all Am I ticking this box? Am I ticking this box? <laughs> exactly. How about this box? Is this box tick? There's no tick here. Where's the tick? I'm looking for a box. There's no tick. Where's my box tick? Oh, blah, 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 blah. Well, to your point, it's, it's the wanting to do it right or getting it perfect. Mm. And I think that's another thing that I appreciated about your um, theater and your group. Um, you explicitly said there is no getting it right. There's just choices and make those choices hmm. and see what feels right and what feels not so right. Um, I think, yeah, that, that was really impressive to me. So yeah, I, I think I had to forget all of my training and then just get back to that. What's my line? All right, here we go. Hmm. I'm going to listen to you. Are there other things that you feel like you had found before training that you then had to find your way back to after training? Yeah, I think spontaneity. I got a lot of notes that I was a very cerebral actor because I wanted to do all of my actor homework and did all of the thinking around it. And it, it didn't serve me. It kept me from being present. So but the, you, were you were spontaneous before, before all of that. Mm -hmm, and wow. so when I, when I scrapped thinking about what well, was my overall <laughs> objective, it just sort of comes intuitively. And for me, it comes from simply reading the lines, what's in the text. And for me, it's far more freeing then because when you're in a room with another actor, it's, if you've made the choice already, you've mm -hmm. made the choice and there's not a lot of leeway or room to explore or play. Mm -hmm. Uh, but if you haven't made, if you can have like maybe a feeling for it, uh, but you haven't made set choices, it allows me to respond organically and honestly to my scene partner. And in those moments of not knowing a lot of fun stuff can happen, or in those moments of failing utterly, mm -hmm. there are terrific discoveries. Oh, that didn't work, but let's keep this part and, and, and work off that. I was thinking about this show I saw at the public and they were smoking a cigarette on stage and the actor accidentally dropped the cigarette and the cigarette dropped into what was maybe a one inch crevice between the, the end of the stage and the skirt into the pit. Oh, wow. Oh, shit. And everybody just looked and they're like, what's, and we were all thinking, where, where did it go? Wait, what's down there? Is it going to catch something on fire? What, like, what's happening? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but we were all instantly in the moment. We were all instantly brought back because there was a surprising, unexpected action. And then you're, you're aware that these are actors on a stage and then it becomes fun. Ooh, what are they going to do? How are they going to, how are they going to respond to this quote unquote, you know, air quotes, real life moment? And the actor walked up. Looked down into the crevice, closed an eye so he could see what was happening to the cigarette, and did the sort of wafted his hand like, Meh, it's fine. And it was it was lovely. It was a relief because mm. he was uh, playing the reality of what had just happened. Sometimes you get that gift of the cigarette falling into a crevice. Yeah. Well, and that's what's great with what your company does. You are constantly asking for audience interaction and response to to force that sort of moment of nothing is rehearsed. You have to respond to what the audience member says or does or, or the passing trains that we, or the, yeah, the passing trains outside the park. Exactly. Were you an actor first or an audience member first? I was an actor first. Really? I was not brought up to see shows. I mean, there, there just weren't things mm -hmm. to go see. Right. It was, was the, it was the doing the thing in the barn for your family that attracted you. Mm -hmm. Do you enjoy going to see theater? I, like you, have a very hard time focusing and it is, it's the training. I cannot turn off my actor brain. I mm. can't do the, why did they do that? That doesn't make sense. Um, very rarely do I think, oh, that was a really interesting choice. And actually, as, as you were both speaking, I wanted to ask you, what was the last performance and or show or moment that did capture and hold your attention? If just for a brief moment. Most of the things I've seen at the Globe, in particular, Michelle Terry's Hamlet, and the As You Like It that they did, both of them, I mean, the entire productions left me in that in that place. And what was different about it? How did they do that? The entire show was about the audience. They explicitly do not set things in this new model. So in a way, I guess that's a cheap answer because it's like, that's why Rude Grooms works the way it does. Is I'm like, holy... Oh! If this happens... Can you think of a moment that you've seen? Most recently is when I went to go see actually Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Mm. Because I didn't really have a lot of high expectations for that movie. I was told that it was interesting. I was really hesitant to see a Tarantino sort of revisionist revenge fantasy about 
Sharon Tate and the Manson family. At a certain point, because I thought the storytelling was so consistent and you could see that they were weaving a narrative together that I sort of, I forgot my reservations and I just got hooked into the story. I was like, you know what? I actually kind of want to see where this goes. It's interesting that you chose a film as your example yeah, and right. not theater. Yeah. Right. So do you go see theater? I do. That's, but, that's a terrible question to ask, right? I do. I do go to see theater, but it's, it's like you said, it's harder because yeah. when I'm watching it live, because I think it is, I think you're correct. I think it's totally different when you're seeing a film because a film can't change. A film is static. Whereas a piece of live theater is fluid. It's always in motion. It could literally be different every day. It could be different every second. Well, see, nine times out of ten, it's not the technical stuff, right? It's just like, I don't believe that. Right. But, what, but uh, before we get off on a tangent, Elizabeth, you can't ask us that. You're the one being interviewed. You're great <laughs> at turning right? an interview see? around. She just flipped this whole thing. It's like, hello but and welcome to what this about one. You? What's, what's, what's the last time you remember feel, having that experience in a live performance theater, not film? Mm-hmm. Um, I, I was very proud of my high school buddy, Jeff Crady, who uh, has been understudying uh, Tootsie on Broadway. And I went and saw him Um, in the lead role. And I went in fully expecting to dislike the musical. Really? Yes. And I had, I went in and my hands crossed and it was the end of a long week and okay, here we go. And I was floored by the storytelling because every moment, uh, was easeful. And for me, that's really, really sort of a critical component. If I feel that someone is pushing for emotion or pushing physically, you know, gripping with their voice or there's tension in their hands, I energetically take that on and become uncomfortable um, as an audience member. For the very torrent, tempest, and as I may say, the whirlwind of your passion, (laughs) you must acquire and make it a temperance that may give it smoothness. (laughs) That makes me so happy. Why the classics? Ever since I was in high school, I, I found it to be a puzzle, a really fun puzzle for the mind to unpack what it means. And I found it an even more interesting and challenging puzzle to make it clear for the audience, a language that we're not used to hearing, words that we're not used to hearing, a cadence that we're not used to feeling. How do you make that really transparent and easy for the audience to, to viscerally get, even though they may not mm-hmm. understand all the, all the words? What do you find is the most effective way to do that? Not overthink it. I think... Even as an actor, there are <laughs> on stage, there are times where I'm like, what the heck did you just say? What does that mean? And I, and I think as actors, our job is to just sort of get the sense across. Mm-hmm. And if we get the sense across, that's enough. I agree. And I, in the Friar Lawrence scene with uh, Romeo, there's the line that's in the text, holy St. Francis, what a change is here. <laughs> and... My my mom, for the longest time, did not believe that that was actually in the text. She yeah. at, at first was like, I love that line that you ad-libbed. And I was like, what are you talking about? And she's like, the Holy St. Francis line instead of holy shit. I was like, I didn't make that up. That's in the text. And I, thought I thought about the Buzz Luhrmann film for years. Yeah. I thought that was like, there were so many moments like that. It was like, oh, this is definitely an ad-lib. Or yeah. it's like definitely a contemporary screenwriter. About this you know, I also heard a lot of, oh, that's the first time I heard that sentence. That's the first time I heard that thought. Mm-hmm. That's the greatest compliment oh, too. Yeah. Because it means you're not playing the pat, you know, approach to this character. Right. I felt that way about your portrayal of, of Peter. In our Romeo and Juliet, I did because I had never really paid attention to Peter in the text. I didn't. Before. I didn't remember Peter. Really, I had. No, I had no recollection of Peter. Monty was devastated because Peter was one of his favorite characters. I had. I had seen the play umpteen dozen times mm-hmm. and had no recollection of Peter. So I, I'm glad that it, it stuck in your memory. I just, for me, I did. I, if I didn't remember the character, then I knew that I had to do something mm-hmm. unique and different with it. Peter's first scene. With the party invitations, you wanted to approach that scene in a different light. When I read it, it seemed really, my heart hurt. I was like, oh, the joke is he can't read and right. now we're going to laugh at him. That And that hurt me. I was like, ah, oh, there's got to be a different way to approach this. Right. The joke has to be something else. Not that he's illiterate, which, which was not unusual, certainly, for uh people at that time when, when these plays were being performed, but now we're in a different, 
time and place. So, um, yeah, I was appreciative that we took a, a far more funny approach. <laughs> so I was the kid who couldn't watch cartoons when I was little mm -hmm. because like the, the road runner and Wiley e. coyote, I found it really painful. I was like, Oh my gosh, he's trying to hurt him. He's dropping anvils on his head. What this, like, I was, oh, wow. maybe I'm just oversensitive. So I couldn't watch cartoon and all my friends would be laughing. You know, this is hysterical, you know, guns going off, you know? And I was like, this is pain. This is, this is really unfortunate. So for whatever reason, when I read that moment in the script, I thought, ah, there's a deficit. This person can't do something. And now he's the butt of the joke. Mm. Um, so I, 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 it just felt wrong. And I felt like there, there must be, um, a more interesting and different choice, which would be unexpected yet true to the text. And I had a few ideas and I'm really happy that Monty then came back with the, ah, oh, the, the text will still work. And the thing is about the action that Peter can't open the envelope. And it's as simple as that. Mm -hmm. no, that was your idea. You said, put that in your email. Oh, today. I thought it was you. Was it? I think it was your idea. Yeah, I think it was you. Well, you know what? We can give each other credit for it. <laughs> Look at this love. It was a collaborative. We did it together. But what was great <laughs> is that it worked. It wasn't forcing the text in a different direction that didn't work. The text still supported that action. And the and the deficit then became Capulet yelling at Peter. And, oh, he's right. got this action to do. And, it's, and that's, that's, I think, more understandable. And, well, something I think about a lot, like... As you, as you mentioned, for Shakespeare's audience, most of the people in the groundling area would have been illiterate, right? So the joke was about him being like them, right? It was about, it was a joke of being, of recognition. And if anything, with the way that at least I think that theater functioned, right? That actor probably went to audience members in the groundling pit and was like, can you read this? Can you read this? Can you read this? Can you read this? And they probably couldn't. Hmm. So it became a joke about like, look at this mass class difference between us. Ha ha, we can't read. Oh, here comes Romeo. He can probably read it. And that's a thing that we don't have, that like universal thing we don't have anymore. But by making it a like, can you open this thing? Because I can't. Kind of gets at that same core intention. When you as an actor are in an environment where you're cast in a role like Peter, but for whatever reason, the artistic environment wants a more quote unquote traditional reading, how do you find your way in an interpretation of a role that you find potentially even offensive? I think the first step would be to have empathy and understanding for the character. For instance, if I were to play Peter as as a character who could not read, my take on it would be dealing with this really um, troubling and uh, realistic issue that people today deal with. And what is that actually like? And I think my take on the comedy then would be a sliver to the left where it's a little bit sadder. And when they ask you to ham it up and... Make yucka, yucka, yucka it. <laughs> then, then, then you yucka, yucka, yucka it up. And then you find that moment with the eye to the audience, the knowing eye. And, and that's the nuance. Yeah. The, the knowing look, the knowing or wink. <laughs> I gotta, if I got to be here, let's figure out how to make it work. I love that. When, when do you stop challenging the director? Hmm. When it stops serving the work. Uh, when, when it becomes contentious, when it, when it becomes not productive, I've been put in those positions before and it's been exceptionally uncomfortable. Uh, directors tend to not like to be challenged in that way, but when there is no way forward, then, ah, you know what, we will, we will do this the way that you would, we will see your artist, artistic vision through the end and it's uncomfortable um, but it, you know, that's part of the job too. Mm. You show up and you do your job. Cool. Cool. Do you edit out these pauses? <laughs> yes. Sometimes yes. And then there are some times where. Not that one. That one's definitely staying in. Yeah. That this one's, is hilarious. Yeah. That one stays Wait, isn't in. Isn't there but... the, every seven minutes there's a pause in a room that, that thing. The that silence has flown off for us. I've never heard that. Oh, yeah. Every seven minutes, it's like clockwork, and it will happen somewhere in a room. I wish you hadn't told minutes. me that, because now in the next time I'm at a party, I'm going to be looking at my watch every seven minutes. My brain is immediately like, you got to check this now. you got to verify it. Fact check it. it. <laughs> how do we want to wind this down? I feel like... I know how we want to wind it down. Please tell us, as, you are ho as the host mm -hmm. of the podcast. Yep. Let's do this. Monty. <laughs> 
What is your favorite word? Lugubrious. Mm. Daniel, what is your least favorite word? Failure. What is your favorite sound? Laughter. What is your favorite food? Unagi sushi. That's all I got. Terry Gross, it's been a pleasure to be on the show with you. <laughs> This week, our wonderful Patreon supporter, Amber Elby, who is at Amber Elby on Twitter, said, hashtag Mr. Amber Elby and I are finally binge listening. Well, welcome back to the madhouse, Amber. So glad that y'all got to binge it a little bit. There's a whole wonderful string of tweets that you can see if you go to at Amber Elby on Twitter, but I did pick one out for you as a cautionary tale. Amber says, well, episode six just spoiled little women for hashtag Mr. Amber Elby. He missed it at the cinema because he had to watch the eight-year-old while I took the 11-year-old and was sincerely looking forward to seeing it on a streaming service. He had a horrified look when y'all mentioned who died. Laughing, crying emoji. If you're listening to this and you've not read or seen Little Women, do not listen to episode six until you correct the mistakes of your life and experience the story of Little Women for yourselves. You are hereby warned let hashtag Mr. Amber Elby be a cautionary tale for you. Also this week, Retro Productions, who is at Retro Prods NYC, says, check out our favorite prop master on At This Would Know this week. We heart at A to Z. Three exclamation marks. Then they tweeted again, fantastic episode, all caps. Fantastic person, also all caps. We love A2Z. She's incredibly talented. Yeah, she is the most amazing. If you have not heard our sit down with Sarah Slagle from last week, episode nine, you have robbed yourself. Learn all about what it is to be a method props designer. Didn't even know that was possible, did you? And enjoy many, many, many of our antics. So thank you so much to Amber and the folks at Retro Productions for joining in the conversation with us this week. If you enjoyed this episode, please do consider reviewing us, subscribing, or connecting with us on the social medias. We are at Rude Grooms on Instagram and Twitter and also on YouTube and we're on Facebook. We're everywhere. Find us. Share a thought. Share a comment. Also, you can email thiswouldknow at rudegrooms.com an audio file of a question or a response, and we will most likely play that on the air. We have our first one, which will be coming on next week's episode from uh, the aforementioned Patreon supporter Amber Elby. Amber tuned in for the live stream recording session of next week's episode, episode 11, with our sharer Deb Radloff, uh, and send us an audio response to that episode. So um, Patreon folk have already heard that on our most recent live stream recording session, um, but you will hear it next week on Deb's episode. So please don't be shy. We love to hear your voices. We love to include all y'all in the conversation. I'm totally going to record so many questions. <laughs> please <laughs> do. Oh my god, please do. Please do. <laughs> oh my god, hell yeah. Oh my A god, hell yeah. A thousand percent do that. Uh, Daniel, what do you have for recommendations this week? So this week for recommendations, I'm actually going to recommend something that has not come out yet, but that I am really excited for. Um... You all have heard me reference Taylor Tomlinson, the stand-up comedian, before on this podcast. She is getting her first Netflix special called Quarter Life Crisis that will be premiering on March 3rd. Um, Taylor is one of my favorite uh, newer stand-up comedians. I've been watching her stuff for a long time now. I'm really excited for her to get this first next Netflix special, and I'm really looking forward to watching it on March 3rd. So I'm going to recommend Quarter Life Crisis by Taylor Tomlinson. Uh, let me know what you think. Watch the show, and then uh, tweet at us what you thought. Tweet at me, and then use the hashtag RGWoodenO so that uh, I can see your responses and we can talk about it in the next week's segment of recommendations and viewer comments. This week, my recommendation is a callback both to episode eight with Anya Saffer and actually to this week's episode as well and the idea of mirror neurons. In Anya's episode, she mentioned Sherry Turkle. So because it was Anya, I immediately went out and Googled Sherry Turkle and got a book called Reclaiming Conversation, The Power of Talk in a Digital Age. And that book is my recommendation this week. It's really, really fascinating. I'm only about halfway through. But if you enjoyed that conversation, those ideas of 
empathy being built through connection and interaction between bodies and there being an actual neurological, biological component to that. And the idea that our new way of communicating largely through digital mediums without that same mirroring possibility for another human body. I highly recommend checking this book out. Uh, If you enjoyed that episode and that conversation, you will love Reclaiming Conversation, The Power of Talk in a Digital Age by Sherry Turkle. And finally, this week, we're going to have two live stream recording sessions of upcoming episodes for our Patreon supporters. On Wednesday, the 26th at 7 p.m., we have Kara Arena, who's our master of music. We're going to sit down with her and start that live stream right at 7 p.m. And then on Thursday, the 27th, we have Bridget Bose, who's our master of movement and also runs Guilty Pleasures Cabaret. And that live stream will start at 7.30 p.m. on Thursday, the 27th. We are so excited for both of these sit downs. Um, and they are only for our most beloved Patreon supporters. You can become one yourself for as little as $4 a month and join us for these live streams. You can join in the conversation with live chat. You get also the entire back catalog of unedited live streams of all prior episodes. For example, this week's episode with Elizabeth is actually less than half the length of the unedited version up on Patreon. We trim them down so that it's more reasonable for the podcast format. But if you love these conversations and want more, you can do it. Just join us right there on Patreon at patreon.com slash rude grooms. Elizabeth, it was so amazing to have you on. Hey, uh, can you please me. tell uh, all of the, all of the humans and other creatures out there who might be listening mm. where they can find you on les social medias? Uh, I don't know if you could tell, but I don't like to talk about myself. So I only have one place where you can find me, and that is Instagram, mm-hmm. Elizabeth.Arens. That's Elizabeth.Arens, Elizabeth with an S, not That's a right. Z. That's right. A-H-R-E-N-S. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of This Wooden O. Thanks so much to Elizabeth Ahrens for joining us this week. My name is Daniel Kemper. And I am Monty. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at the Daniel Kemper. You can follow me on Twitter at Montgomery Sutto No N. What about on the Instagram? On Instagram at Montgomery Sutton, my full name with all the letters. Wow, yay! Tune in next week when we will be featuring uh, Rude Groom's associate sharer, Deb Radloff. What? We, we got Deb Radloff? We got Deb Radloff. How did we get her? We asked. And we Which shall receive. Indeed. Bye, everybody. See you next week. Bye. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of This Wooden O, hosted and produced by Daniel Kemper and Montgomery Sutton. Original music is by Kara Arena. This Wooden O is brought to you by Rude Grooms, a Queens, New York-based theater company creating epically intimate theatrical experiences in public spaces, non-traditional venues, and new media. Learn more at rudegrooms.com or follow us on social media at Rude Grooms and at This Wooden O.